Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, 8 to 13 will be our verses we examine this morning. I'll remind you that last week we examined the plan of God for the one new man created in Christ Jesus. And Paul wrote that he had received this plan by direct revelation of God. And this had given him a stewardship of grace that he might preach to the Gentiles that the Jews and Gentiles are fellow heirs. They are members of the same body and they are partakers of the same promises. That means the Jews need Jesus just like the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Now our takeaways concerning the plan of God were these. Pursuing the will of God will always be opposed. Whenever you decide to do what God says, serve him in the way that he is worthy of. The enemy is always going to raise up his ugly head and seek to slow us down or take us out. But we also know that God's word will always confirm what to do and his spirit will lead us where to do it. And we do have the word of God as our guide or guard, I should say. And the spirit of God is our guide. In other words, what the church should be doing today is exactly what the church was doing in the first century. We also noted that fulfilling God's plan is dependent upon his strength and power, not ours. We never have to worry about, can I do this? But rather, we need to know if this is something he has called us to do, because he will always do it through us. And it's his strength and power we rely on, not our own. Now, at this point in time, case in point, Paul had been imprisoned for four years. And yet he was using that time as an opportunity to write letters, to minister to those who were chained to him uh, under house arrest. Uh, he had a Roman guard and a 12-inch chain on each of his arms. And they were actually the captives, not Paul, uh, because he was sharing Jesus with them at every turn. Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem. He was then taken to Caesarea, as we found in the book of Acts. And then because his life was threatened, he was taken to uh, Rome and incarcerated there for two years. Now, in Rome, he stayed in a rented house, which he, by the way, had to pay for. Can you imagine being a prisoner? You got to rent your own cell. Paul had to pay for his house arrest. He was chained to the Roman guards, as I said. He had the freedom to entertain visitors while he was awaiting his trial before Nero. Yet, in all this, Paul rejoiced because the gospel was being advanced during his imprisonment. So that means no matter what we go through, we can always be the church. Amen. We can always preach Christ and him crucified. Amen? Amen? Think about what he said to the elders of the city he was now writing to back in Acts 20. He said to the elders of Ephesus, And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. In other words, knowing that this is going to happen to me doesn't move me off course. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Has God given us his grace? Yes, amen. Do we continue to experience it today? Yes. And he even will manifest it in wonderful ways as we seek to do what Paul did, and that's reach the world for Christ. Now, where the Spirit led Paul, there was opposition, and there was tribulation, yet these things did not cause him to get off course. He didn't even count his own life dear, as he said, but his main priority in life was to finish what Jesus assigned him to do, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Listen, I think we're running out of time. I think the church age is about to end. I think we need to tell people about Jesus all day, every day, even people we've told about before, told about him before, even people who have rejected him, maybe even a thousand times. We'll tell them again because it's only Jesus that can save their soul. And we are in a transitional period, I believe, prophetically in this season of church history in that we need to be looking up for our redemption is nigh. We need to be reaching out because our redemption is nigh and we know what's going to happen during the tribulation is unlike anything that has ever happened on the planet before. Jesus said, if I don't come back and stop it, it's going to kill everybody. That's what it means when he says no flesh would survive. So Jesus is coming back. Good news. We're coming with him. Yeah. 
He's not coming back for us at the end of the tribulation. He's coming back with us at the end of the tribulation. We don't have an appointment with the tribulation for we haven't been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So maybe today we'll meet him in the air and forever be with him. But I do know this for sure. One of these mornings when we get up, it's going to be that morning. It may not be today, but it could be tomorrow. It may not be tomorrow, but it could be the day after that. We are living in a time where time is a very limited commodity. Now, last week we unveiled the plan that God had not made known in ages past, but is now revealed through the mystery, which is the church. And he did this through the holy apostles and prophets. Now this week he's going to give us the purpose of the plan. Where we unfolded the plan last week, today we'll see the purpose of God's plan. Now in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen to 22, we'll find some wisdom here, where Paul says, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, your gatherings aren't for the things you're supposed to be doing, but they're for lesser things, worse things. He says, first of all, when you come together as a what? A church. He says, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. He said, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating and drinking, for in eating rather, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is what? Hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Paul says, I do not praise you. Now, Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth were strongly worded because their actions were denying the one new man that Jesus had created through his death, resurrection, and ascension. He says there are schisms in the church that is translated as divisions, and that means a split or a gap. And we hear about church splits all the time in these days, right? He says there's splits and gaps among you, and he said that's because there are heresies, and that's a transliterated word. The word in the Greek is uh, heresia, and uh, it means heresy. It's translated as factions here. And he says there are heresies among you, and he says this is what will reveal those who are approved and should be recognized as proper leaders. In other words, they don't teach heresy. Is there heresy being taught today? Oh, yeah. Yes, there is, sadly. Not here. Right. Amen. 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 Now, the evidence Paul presents of the division in the church was that some came to the love feast and ate while others had nothing to eat. He says that there were financial schisms in the church. He says there were also moral schisms because some felt comfortable enough and basically were abusing the grace of God by thinking they could come to the love feast and get drunk and then take communion. Paul says you're doing these things when you're supposed to be coming together as the one new man in Christ. And remember, Corinth was predominantly a Greek church, obviously, because obviously, it's in Greece. And it reminds us that the Greeks thought everybody but the Greeks were barbarians. So that tells us that much of the schisms that were in the church were ethnic in nature. And our title this morning is something that every Christian is looking for and should be desiring and wanting to be a part of. And it is what Jesus came to establish through his death, resurrection, and ascension. And that is, here's our title, you ready? The Perfect Church. <laughs> the perfect church. Now, I've heard this said, said it myself over the years. If you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. <laughs> now, you know, in thinking this through and especially studying this week, I say, if you find the perfect church, join it. Be a part of it because every church is going to be filled with imperfect people. Amen. But the plan in and of itself is perfect because the one who is the head of the church is perfect. And that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, he even said, Jesus even said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 48, therefore you shall be what? Perfect. That can be mature or complete, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Does Jesus have the complete plan 
for the church. Yes. Is it perfect? Yes. Absolutely. And yet Corinth was a church filled with imperfect people, just like every church today. But listen, Paul didn't hide behind that. Paul didn't say, well, you know, people will be people. Boys will be boys kind of thing. He called them on the carpet. He said, you guys are totally missing the mark. I'm not going to praise you. I'm not going to uh, speak words of kindness to you. I'm going to call you out and tell you to straighten out these things. And listen, just because every church today is filled with imperfect people, we can't hide behind that either. Where'd you go? <laughs> listen, this is just a general message. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here today. That's how it, we're, we're teaching the text, right? Now, listen, we are the one new man. And would you not agree that how we act, how we treat each other, how we reach out is communicating something about the head of the church to the community we're in? Yes. And that's what we're talking about here today. Christ is still the head of the church. Amen. Amen. And therefore, we are communicating something to those around us about him. And that's true of every church in every city and country around the world. Now, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and by the way, this is a long introduction, so we will get to the message in a half hour or so. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may, what's the next word? Prove. Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hebrews 12, and 23 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to the God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And then Revelation 3, 1 and 2 will add this, and the, the heading over this section in Revelation 3 of the letters to the seven churches is Sardis was known as the dead church. So Jesus said, say Jesus said, Jesus. to the church at Sardis, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works and you have a name that you are alive or your reputation is that you're alive, but you are what? Yeah. Dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works, what? Perfect before God. Now listen, I don't believe that the Bible teaches the doctrine of perfectionism. Otherwise, the Bible wouldn't say, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, until we're in the presence of the Lord. Only then will we see him and be like him, for we'll see him as he is. But I do believe that as those who are in Christ, who is perfect, we as the servants of Christ ought to pursue being like Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is the founder and the head of the church. Yeah. Jesus is God. Yeah. God is perfect. Yeah. And we're supposed to be like him. That's what our name means. Christian means Christ-like. Yeah. So we have to have an object that we identify with in order to pursue it. And according to Jesus, his plan and model for the church is perfect. And the fact that imperfect people try and follow the plan and don't always do so perfectly and aren't always successful at it doesn't change the perfection of the plan. So that's what we're talking about when we're looking at the perfect church this morning. What God would have us to do as a body, a collective body of believers here in uh, Tustinana, <laughs> Tustinana Mesa. We, you know, we've been, maybe that's it. We have been searching for what to do with the T of CCT because we can't be Calvary Chapel Tustin anymore. Maybe we can be Tustin Anna Mesa. <laughs> Where's Pastor Dave? Pastor, he tried cities. We tried three cities and here we are in the third one. So remember this as we launch out this morning. If you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. We have to have an objective. We have to have a goal. There has to be something we are striving to be like, and we'll see a part of the plan here this morning. So would you stand and read with me, please? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, and we'll find the purpose of the one new man in Christ Jesus. 
Verse 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And Father, we are grateful this morning for this passage, this letter that teaches us much about what it is we are to believe, what it is we are to do, not so we can earn our salvation, but so we can express it, that others may long for it and, and desire it. So Father, teach us this morning the perfect plan. Uh, you is the head, your son is the head. Uh, teach us how to follow hard after him, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now the first component of the perfect church comes from verses 8 and 9, and obviously <laughs> Humility, humility immediately comes into view. Now in this, in the Greek that is, Paul actually invents a word because what the Greek text actually says is to me who am leaster of all the saints. Now leaster isn't actually a word. I've made up a few words over the years myself. But this is translated as less than the least. Now some would say Paul was playing off his Latin name Paulus, which means small or little, but I don't think that's likely in light of what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, where he describes himself self as the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Aren't you glad that the Lord separates us as far as the east is from the west, from our sins, from our past? And Paul was humbled by the grace that God had shown him as one who once persecuted the church. Now, Paul never got away from his past in a sense, but neither did he let his past determine his present nor his future. And his humility was genuine, and he was in awe of the fact that God chose him to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches that are in Christ Jesus. We should be in awe of the fact every day that God saved us. Amen. We should be thankful that he saved us in spite of us. We should be blessed that he would consider us to be the vessels through which he is going to communicate truth to a lost and dying world. And commentators and translators have tried a multitude of ways to explain and define the very lengthy Greek word, anexkitniastos, uh, which is translated as unsearchable. So rather than list all the different offerings of the translators, I think we can best understand unsearchable through Job 9.10, which says he does things past finding out. Yes, wonders without number. You're never going to come to the end of the things that God can do because he can do anything and he does them all well. Amen? Amen. And Paul counts among the great things without number that God can do his own calling. He says the riches of God can't be numbered for they are infinite. And as I said at the outset, uh, his humility is clearly an attribute that is displayed in our text, but it's what humility causes him to do and write that will take us to our components of the perfect church. Paul says that his mission was to make all see, for everyone to know, the mystery of the one new man in Christ Jesus created from Jews and Gentiles. He points out that this mystery was the plan all along. He says it's even from the beginning of the ages when God the Father created all things through Christ Jesus. You'll find that in the parallel chapter of uh, Colossians 1, 15 to 17. All things were created by Jesus. There was nothing that was created that wasn't through him and for him. And he is before all things. Amen? Amen. And within God's creation was the hidden mystery of a new race of people that would come from every tribe nation and tongue and ethnic background and station of life, and he calls it the church. Now here's the first component of the perfect church, and it comes from the content of our text rather than the context of our text, even though we're not going to depart from the context. Here's the first of our three. You ready this morning? Yeah. Listen, the perfect church believes and teaches that the Bible is the inspired and infallible word of God. 
Amen. The perfect church, the complete church, the mature church, the church that Jesus established, teaches, or believes and teaches that the Bible is the inspired and infallible word of God. Now, you might be thinking, how do you arrive at that from these verses? Well, the answer is this. Look at what Paul mentions here. He mentions the grace of God. He mentions the gospel of God. He mentions God's plan to save the Gentiles and the Jews and make them one new man. He speaks of the unsearchable riches we have in Christ. He wants the world to see that Christians are Jesus' disciples. He mentions that God created all things through Jesus. Where do we find these things? Go back to Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. That's the pr first preaching of the gospel. It is called in theological circles the Proto-Evangelicum, the first preaching of the gospel message, and it was preached by God himself. What about grace? Go back to Genesis. Genesis 6, 8. Noah found what? Grace. Where? In the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 12, 3. Here's a promise of blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, Genesis 1, 1, obviously uh, one of the most important verses in the Bible. In the beginning... God created what? The heavens and the earth. Everything Paul said about the mystery now revealed of the, as the one new man, the church, was biblically based. He mentions the gospel found in Genesis 3.15. God, the creator of all things, Genesis 1.1. Through the descendants of Abraham came the Messiah. Through the Messiah, all the families of the earth can be blessed, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And the reason Noah was saved from perishing from in the flood was because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Paul had received grace. Paul wanted to know uh, and others to know and experience the blessings of Christ. Paul did not shy away from the fact that God is the creator of all things, even though Greco-Roman culture that he lived in believed otherwise. They believed there were multiple gods that participated in setting all things into existence. There is one God, and he is the true and living God, and he has a name, and his name is Jehovah, and he is the only God who can save. Amen? Amen. Now, the doctrinal principles Paul mentioned here were founded in Genesis. So that tells us, since at the time of Paul's writings, some of the things he was quoting or uh, referring to were thousands of years old. That tells us today, thousands of years after Paul wrote, we need to be careful about anyone, any group, who says the Bible has grown outdated and it is now antiquated or out of step with culture. Listen, the Word of God is not supposed to be in step with culture. It is supposed to tell culture to watch your step, how you are to walk and how you are to live in order to please God. I don't know why so many people today have a problem with saying we ought to live to please God. After all, Jesus said in John 8, 29, I always and only do that which pleases the Father. Yes. Aren't yes. we in Christ? Yes. Aren't we supposed to be like Christ? Yes. So if Christ only did what pleases the Father, shouldn't we? Yes. Why is that so problematic for so many today? Well, because they're out of step. They're out of step with the Word of God. And listen, the Bible is the Word of God. Yes. God doesn't change. Right. So the word doesn't change. And it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And listen this morning, if the Bible is subjective, as many propose it to be today, who determines what parts are valid and what parts are outdated? Who's going to make that decision? Now, I've met some wonderfully smart people, but I've never met anyone who's even remotely close to being as smart as God. Amen. And we've said it before, we need to remind ourselves frequently, God's smarter than all of us, like by a way bunch. <laughs> Right? Now, we've mentioned this before. This just popped in my head uh, yesterday. That we've talked about the principle. It's a scientific principle called irreducible complexity. And basically, it means that biological systems that supposedly had e have evolved did so through small successive modifications. And then, you know, simple life became complex life. Well, irreducible complexity says that's impossible. Because there's a complexity that's necessary for advanced life forms. And you can only back up the evolutionary chain so far before life isn't sustainable or isn't even possible. Does not the Bible present to itself to us as living and powerful? Is it not a living organism? 
because Jesus is the word in the way it presents itself to us. And the fact is, just like with irreducible complexity in biology, if you start to remove parts of the Bible, it damages the function of the whole. It's an all or nothing proposition, right? Yeah. That's why Jesus is presented to us metaphorically in John 1, 1 as the word of God. He wasn't a God as the Jehovah Witnesses say. He is the God, the only true and living God who manifests himself because he is God and can do anything in three distinct personages. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, everything Paul taught was established in Genesis in our passage. Remove the Genesis narrative and you've taken the life out of what Paul is teaching here. In Acts 20, 25 to 27, Paul says, And indeed, now I know that all of you among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Again, he's speaking to the Ephesian elders after having spent three years with them and now getting ready to depart. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I haven't shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Does that not imply that you become guilty of the blood of others if you do not teach the whole counsel of God? Listen, we're going to teach the Bible here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, so we can understand the context and the complexity and the wonder of the majestic Word of God. And the perfect church believes and teaches that the Bible is inspired and infallible. And that keeps us innocent of the blood of those in our communities who choose perishing over eternal life. And people make that choice every day. Amen? Amen. Now, 10 and 11 will give us our second uh, component of the perfect church. To the intent now that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now remember Paul's in one of his famed literary parentheses that began back in verse 2. He said in verse 1, for this reason, and then he says in verse 1, or verse 14, rather, for this reason. He returns, uh, gets back on topic, so to speak. Now, he, as we mentioned last week, was talking about his own calling and God's plan for his own life. And now we see him presenting the bigger picture. As Paul mentions that by the church, the manifold wisdom of God is made known to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, the word manifold, the Greek word translated as manifold, gives us a hint as to exactly what aspect of God's wisdom he's talking about. Now, the word manifold can mean multifaceted. It can have multiple outlets or directions from a single source. But I think the context here would allow us to better see it as multicolored, and it can be translated as such. As a matter of fact, when you read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and you come across Joseph's multicolored coat, it's the same word that's used here, uh, translated as manifold. Now that tells us that Paul is very clearly saying in the wisdom of God, he was going to create a new race of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And therefore, he is reminding us through these magnificent words of Paul that we need to continue in that today, and that's part of the perfect church. <laughs> now, some see these principalities and powers as the political economic structures of human society. Now, you're going to have a hard time making that case through Scripture, but it does fit well into the heretical seven mountain mandate promoted by the New Apostolic Reformation, which is simply not true. Listen, I, I got news for this crowd. They're not going to dominate the world. The church is not going to dominate the world. The church is going to be taken out of the world in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And then the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the whole world for seven years, and then... One who is going to dominate and rule the nations with a rod of iron is going to come back and we're going to be with him and rule with him for a thousand Amen. years. Amen? Amen? Things aren't going to get better and better. Things are going to get worse and worse. That's how Jesus said things are going to go or the progression, the prophetic progression is going to lead. So listen, we also need to be careful about anyone who is teaching things that are contrary to Scripture and claiming that they are divinely inspired as this group does. Now, in Ephesians 6.12, Paul will say this once we get there. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of what? Darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, principalities and powers in chapter 6 are called a spiritual host of wickedness and rulers of darkness in Ephesians 6, then it can't mean the political economic structures of human society in chapter 3. After all, it's the same author writing to the same audience, and therefore that would be confusing, and God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Amen? Amen. Now, we also need to note that spiritual host of wickedness is not used in our verses, but in the heavenly places is. So in chapter 6, Paul is uh, addressing the kingdom of fallen angels. And in our chapter, he's referring to the angels of God's kingdom who did not fall with Lucifer. So the phrase principalities and powers is the rank and file of heavenly angels. Now, angels are powerful. Amen? Amen. Go to 2 Kings and one angel in one night slew 185,000 Assyrians. According to the book of Revelation, there's going to be a battle in heaven. Michael and his angels are going to fight against the devil and his angels. Guess who wins? The good guys wins. And there's no place found for Satan and his fallen angels in the heavenly realm anymore. They're kicked out of heaven and down to the earth. And Satan at that point, we're told, knows he has but a short time in Revelation 12. And the Bible even says, woe to the earth and its inhabitants. Now, some see this section as meaning the church is going to evangelize the realm of fallen angels. But that doesn't work either. Because the Bible doesn't say anywhere, give any mention or inclination that fallen angels can be redeemed. As a matter of fact, the opposite is taught. Matthew 8, 28 to 29, we're told when he, Jesus, had come to the other side to the country of the Gergesenes, there they met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they, the demons that possessed them, cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before what? Before the time. That tells us they knew what was coming. They knew their eternal destiny, and they didn't want to be cast into that place of torments before the time. And the fate of fallen angels is already sealed, as evidenced by their question to Jesus. So evangelizing fallen angels is not part of the church's mission. It's not part of the perfect church. Now, in 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, you guys still here? Yeah. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, we're told, Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who, has, uh, who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to uh, us, they were ministering to things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. What an interesting phrase. Now, angels are not omniscient. They're powerful, but they're not omniscient. They're not like God. They're created beings too, right? That's why uh, Satan and his claim, I, I will be like the Most High, he realized that he wasn't. He had to say, I'm going to exalt my throne above his because he knew it wasn't and he was seeking to become God or like God or be over God and he isn't he has an eternal destiny that's already sealed and someday he's going to quit hassling us amen. Amen. amen now angels are not omniscient they don't know everything they are ministering spirits but the whole new man thing was a mystery to them and they looked at the church with wonder and what part of their wonder had to be was that God would make men like Paul who persecuted the church and men like Peter who thrice denied the Lord, his primary apostles at the birth of the church age. So what can we glean about the perfect head of the church and his perfect plan for the perfect church? Well, listen, here's the thing I think we need to make note of. Listen, this is number two. The perfect church is a tangible expression of the love and power of God. The perfect church is a tangible, visible, touchable expression of the love and power of God. Now listen, if the ministering spirits in the heavenly places learn more about the manifold wisdom of God through the one new man known as the church, then shouldn't people around us be making the same conclusions and observations? 
if angels are learning more about God through watching the church and what God has done in the church, shouldn't our neighbors? I'm sorry. Did we say the final prayer already? Where'd you guys go? <laughs> now, Paul is going to say in a couple of chapters, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and did what? Gave himself for her. Now, love is what should be found when someone looks into the church. God's love for broken people. The transformative power of God should be seen in God's reconciled and redeemed people. People ought to see that we're different. I've told you before, it hasn't happened in a while since we've been at this for quite a few years. I think the word got out that I really am a Christian. <laughs> but there used to be people who would come and visit from the church I grew up in that thought, nah, it can't be. He can't. He, I don't even think he's a Christian, let alone a pastor. So they had to come and see if it was true. I met multitudes of them at the door on different occasions. God can use anybody. Amen? Amen. Now, Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have what? Love, love for one another. And listen, the problem in our day is that love has been redefined. Love is no longer speaking the truth. Because accepting what others perceive to be true is what love is defined as today. And listen, we're not doing anybody a, a service by uh, promoting heresy or protecting heresy under the banner of love. What did Paul do when he came to Corinth? He said, you're messing up. I'm not going to praise you in this. You guys are wrong. And heresy is the reason for the divisions in the church. And that's what's going on today. And we need to be aware of it. And that comes from being aware of it comes from teaching the whole counsel of God. Amen. Now, this is why love and truth are elements of the perfect church and need to continue. In John 8, 31 to 36, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the what? Truth. truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him. I find this to be one of the most comical uh, phrases in the Bible or statements. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Really? What do you call over 400 years in bondage to the Egyptians? I'm not sure where they came up with this. But how can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits a sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be what? Free, free indeed. There are billions of people on the planet today who say, I'm not in bondage to anyone. I'm in charge of my own life. I'm the captain of my own ship, the master of my own destiny. They, like the Jews, deny, at least in John, deny that they are in bondage. Now listen, we need to remember there's a freedom that is exclusive to Christians. Hello? Amen. There is a freedom that is exclusive to you and I as Christians. It comes from the Son of God and is made known even to principalities and powers in heavenly places by the church. And this is how we know that the efforts today to make the church more acceptable to the world are not of the Lord. We're not supposed to be like the world. Amen. We're supposed to be distinct from the world. We're supposed to be different from the world. And it's not creating a church that is more like the uh, unbelieving world that is going to draw them to the Lord. It is the differences, the distinctions they see in us, the confidence they see in us, the peace that passes understanding they see in us that is exclusive to us, that is going to make them realize, I don't have what they have and I want it. Now, the perfect church is a tangible manifestation of God's love and power. Amen? Now, look at 12 and 13. Then Paul says, In whom the Lord Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ our Lord, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. Now, what a wonderful truth this is here, that we can enjoy this again exclusively as the church. We have bold access with confidence through faith in Christ. What do we have bold access to? Who do we have bold access to? Well, that was answered in 2.18. For through him, Jesus, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit to whom? 
to the Father. Hebrews records the same truth in 19 to 25 of chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is what? Faithful. Faithful. And let us stir one another, let us consider one another in order to stir up what? Love. Love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day, the day of the Lord approaching. Can we see it approaching? So we need to be together a lot funny we get a pandemic that says you can't be together when the bible says when you see these things approaching you need to be together a lot i wonder if there's any spiritual component to what's happening in our world today what do you think now let's pause here for a moment before we close there are people today who are fond of saying you don't have to go to church to be a christian we've all heard that right and in one sense that that's going to church doesn't make you a christian because non-christians go to church all over the world right But to say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian or Christians don't have to attend church, let me ask those who say and think such things, how then are you going to make known the manifold wisdom of God, the principalities and powers? Unless you're gathered together collectively with a group of other people that share the oneness in Christ, how are you going to let principalities and powers know the mystery that God has revealed through the church? If you never meet with the rest of the one new man, or at least a portion in your geographic area. How's the world going to know we're his disciples if we don't gather together to be a tangible expression of God's love and power? I mean, think about it in the rest of life. You can't say you're on a sports team if you've never played or practiced with them. (laughs) Right? You can't say you work for a certain company or have a certain job if you never go there and receive a paycheck from them. You can't say you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't even know you. (laughs) Right? So why would you be able to say, I'm part of the church, but I never go? Where'd you go? (laughs) Our illustrations didn't break down there with the last one. You know, the other three made the point. And those who say the church is filled with hypocrites or the church is filled with imperfect people make a true statement. And while that is true, Jesus surrounded himself with imperfect people. People who forsook him. People who abandoned him when they should have stuck with him at his most difficult hour. He'd just sweat great drops of blood. And yet when push came to to shove and things got tough, they all forsook him and fled just as he said they would. And yet after he died, spent the weekend in a tomb and resurrected, who did he go looking for? He went looking for those imperfect people. He goes looking for us too. Aren't you glad for that? And here's the thing. This is one of my favorite parts about the New Testament. One of the most magnificent things that I find such great hope in. Even after three denials, Jesus picked Peter to give birth to the church age. Peter's the one who preached the first sermon. Peter's the one through whom God added 3,000 souls to the church at the first sermon the one who probably went further than the others, even though they may have physically fled. Peter, when confronted, said, I don't even know the guy. I don't even know the guy. And the third time, he did it with an oath to validate what he was saying. And listen, one thing, J. Vernon McGee, who has just so many wonderful bullet statements that I'm sure many of us have heard over the years, he said this in a commentary I read, gosh, 25 years ago, and it stuck with me. And it was in regards to those who say you don't have to be a Christian to go to church or you don't have to serve at the church, any of those things. And his statement was this, the church is not for you, you're for the church. The church is not for you, you're for the church. And, you know, we, we could expand on that and talk a little bit more about that and incorporate worship. Worship's not for you. Worship's for the Lord. Yes. Right? Yes. So I'd be super careful about criticizing worship because it's not 
what you like. Because it's not about you. It's about him, right? Now listen, we all have our preferences of music. You know, some of you, I, I have a broad spectrum of musical taste. I grew up with our home. Uh, my dad loved music too. And we would hear one day Mario Lanza blasting opera on the stereo. I love opera music. I love Andrea Bocelli. And then a half hour later, here comes the Doobie Brothers playing. <laughs> and my dad listened to anything and everything. I, I like hard rock music. I like opera. I'm not going to say anything about country music. <laughs> but I like some of the country rock from back in the day, Marshall Tucker Band, Leonard Skinner, and stuff like that. But you know what? Everybody has musical taste, but listen, you can't throw that on top of worship because worship is an expression to God. Well, that's just not my style of worship. Well, what is your style of praising God, of living to declare Him? doesn't matter what our tastes are, right? Because we're here to exalt the name of Jesus. Amen. And listen, it's when we love in spite of our differences and in spite of our imperfections that the world knows that we are his disciples. And if we act like the world when difficulty comes, then the only conclusion the world can draw is you don't have something that I need. And you're no different than me. Now, back to our regularly scheduled message. <laughs> In 8 and 9, Paul mentions Jesus Christ as the creator of all things. In 10 and 11, he says Jesus Christ is the Lord. In 12 and 13, he uses the phrase in him in reference to Jesus Christ, our Lord, the creator of all things. Now, here's the last thing to look for in search of the perfect church. And it's beyond obvious. It's silly and overly simplistic. And it shouldn't need to be said, but it does. You ready? The perfect church is always talking about Jesus. The perfect church is always talking about Jesus. Now that shouldn't need to be said, but in an age where some groups gather and talk about how to improve their lives and call it church, and how other groups gather and the pastor talks more about himself than Jesus, and still others promote their denomination more than they exalt the name of Jesus, this needs to be said. The church is a group that talks about Jesus, the wonder of his name, his power and majesty. Look at every section of verses we looked at today. Paul's talking about Jesus. He's the creator. He's the Lord. In him we have access to the Father. In Acts 4.12, Luke would write, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be what? Saved. Saved. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, or Philippi. <clears throat> that is our next books to study, by the way. In 2, 5 through 11, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and those under the earth, the living and the dead, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now... Remember, every means every, every time. So if we ought to be mentioning the name of Jesus, shouldn't his followers be the one who have that frequent on their lips? When we gather together, shouldn't we be talking about him? Shouldn't we mention the salvation that is exclusively through him? And remember where we started, Paul said, I am less than the least of the saints, yet grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Now listen, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. God distributes his gifts among the saints according to his will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says, you can't go to a school of miracles and learn how to do them. You can't go to a school of prophecy and learn how to be one. 
because these are things that God distributes according to his will. And we also have to remember that our collective mission is to preach Christ Amen. to a lost and dying world because his is the only name by which one can be saved. Yes. So if we're going to get together, that's what we ought to be talking about. How are we going to reach this community? How are we going to display the tangible love of Jesus Christ in our midst and through our collective gatherings? How are we going to accomplish the goal of the perfect church, which is when people look into us, they say, hey, you know what? I experienced the love that I've, I've not seen or that I've been searching for or that I've never found or even knew that existed. And boy, there's a lot of people who don't know what true love is in our world today because it's been redefined. There's people around us every day, all day, who need to hear about Jesus. Amen. And listen, Paul closes his parentheses. We're not going to say much because we'll talk more about it next time. He says, don't lose heart because of my tribulations for you. He said, because actually my tribulations are part of why you've received salvation or your glory is how he puts it. And listen, if I hear one thing more than any other in my travels, it is I can't find a Bible teaching church. And if you're looking for the perfect church, it's going to be one where the name of Jesus is mentioned more than the pastor's name. Amen. Amen. That's why Spurgeon said, follow the master, not the pastor. Now, and when that is true, you'll find that Christ is actually the head of the church. Any church you visit is going to be filled with imperfect people trying to serve a perfect Savior. It will be a loving place. It will be an empowered place. The word will be respected and dissected, not redacted and disregarded. And don't lose heart because in this life we'll have tribulations. Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. Soon we're going home. Amen. Amen. Father, we are grateful again for this incredible text and thank you for revealing your plan. And Lord, we recognize we all fall short. Uh, every church is filled with people that are trying to work their way through loving and serving you, doing the right thing and battling against the principalities and powers and the spiritual hosts of wickedness, the rulers of darkness who are trying to keep us from the perfection of your plan. <clears throat> but Lord, we thank you that you continue as you did with Paul, even in the midst of his uh, past and how he was so ashamed of it. You still chose him and still made him an apostle and still sent him to the Gentiles to be the preacher of the grace or the gospel of grace. Thank you. You have that same plan for us to go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would give us that passion, that sense of urgency about those around us who are perishing. And while we are rejoicing in the fact that you're about to come get us, may we be brokenhearted over the fact that many aren't going. Change us, Lord, I pray. Help us to be the church that you have called us to be and made us in Christ. And thank you that we have access with confidence to the Father through you. We thank you for our time together today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're watching online, and, and my, Terry and I have been talking about this a lot, uh, and it always touches my heart, having been a prodigal, my son, myself, rather. Um, prodigal son, myself, is what I was trying to say. <clears throat> if you're out there messing around, come home. Get back to the Father's house. You're eating from a pig trough. This world has nothing to offer you at all. Nothing in the world is better than serving Jesus. Yes. Nothing in the world is better than being part of a loving body of believers who honor and respect the Word of God. There's nothing out there for you. If you're online, watching online, there's nothing out there for you either. Come home. It's time to come home. He's coming to get us. So let me encourage you in the quietness of your heart in this last minute. If you've been out there messing with things you shouldn't be or falling into old things that he set you free from, let me just kind of take a Pauline position. Knock it off. <laughs> Stop it. You have the power within you to break through those things, right? Yes. You know, it's so funny. I, I 
shared with you many, many times about my battles with booze. When I uh, came back from the pig trough I was living in, and cigarettes, you know, and asthma since I was six, so I started smoking to cure it. <laughs> <laughs> cigarettes dropped off instantly and permanently. The drugs dropped off instantly and permanently, but it took me four years to sober up. But I won yeah, through the power of Christ. Yeah. And you know, it, uh, it wasn't just four constant years of drinking. It was months where I'd stay sober, wouldn't have a single drink, and then I'd pick up right where I left off and take off again and start sucking whiskey out of a bottle all day. But you know what? Finally, the Lord got a hold of me when I quit blaming him. If you would help me, I did. You're the one that keeps drinking. <laughs> I came to realize that although I was part of the father's family, I never stopped being that. But although I'd come home, I was still participating in what pigs do. And I was eating from the trash. And you know what? You don't have to do that as a believer in Christ. You don't have to eat out of the trough. He's got better food. He's got better drink. He's got living water. Yeah. Remember his encounter with the woman at the well? Hey, I've got water that if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. And you know what? When I actually came to my senses and came to the reality of the freedom I had in Christ, I've never desired taking a drink again. I've never attended a meeting. I don't fight that. I could walk down the booze aisle Anytime. I don't make a habit of that, by the way. <laughs> but it used to tempt me. It used to torment me, but not anymore because I have the free, indeed, freedom that we talked about today. And you have it too. You just have to walk in. The prodigals, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Don't let the devil push you around. Resist him and he'll flee from you. Amen. Come home. Amen. Get back to dad's house. Life is better there. Amen.